you're going to hear things that are right at the cutting edge of science. We had changed uh, wheat into franken wheat, and they didn't know it. You've got damage that needs to be repaired. You've got to get your adrenals back. You've got to get your thyroid back. You've got to reduce the inflammation. You've got to give your body super nutrients, good bacteria, digestive enzymes, and agents for the intestinal tract to heal itself. And they could not figure out why they couldn't walk. Paralyzed. And no one could explain why. Medical enigma. Three months later, 24 of the 25 could walk. I've seen so many healthy patients in their mid-80s, just fully vital, able to do almost anything they want to do. I so wish that all the gastroenterologists and neurologists and the psychiatrists and the obstetric gynecologists and the fertility specialists and the orthopedic surgeons and all these people would just get in a room and look at this stuff together. Doc, I am so suicidal. I'm on a road right now, right to your office. It's everything I can do to not drive this car into a bridge. She had introduced gluten just an hour before that. It is no longer the staff of life that it was promised. It has become this inflammatory force that has profoundly affected us, driving some of my patients to suicide. I see in this room here some of my patients that have been with me for over 20 years. That I told over 20 years ago to go off of gluten. So is this a fad? No, I think the public is waking up to the fact that there's something to this. That when they go off of gluten, they feel better. Welcome to functional medicine. You have to have friends, family, and people that you can relate to and share with. You need to be part of the web of community. That's why being local is so important. It should empower you to live an anti-inflammatory lifestyle that's clean so you can really fully live what God intended us to. So does that mean that everybody can benefit from going gluten-free? Yes. Gluten, hot, hot topic. It worries me a little bit because I've been in practice here for about 24 years now and I was first exposed to American medicine. If those of you that don't know me, I'm originally from the Netherlands. Uh, with a product called KM. I don't know if any of you remember KM. But here I was just practicing innocent little me and doing the thing that, I, that I've been taught to do. And this patient brought in this bottle. Here, doc. Saved me from whatever it was. I don't remember what it was, but basically saved his or her life. And it was a bottle called KM. And I thought, hmm, wow. Any good studies behind it? Oh yeah, there's lots of good studies behind it. And I just got pounded with all these pamphlets, very beautiful. And then, wouldn't you know it, the next day another one. And then another one. And I, pretty soon I was inundated with KM. Saved people's lives. Heard the same story over and over. I checked into it and it was nothing more than potassium with some weird herbs. No real studies behind it. But, hmm, interesting. Wouldn't you know it? A few months later, next thing comes across. And I was just been experiencing wave after wave of a product that seems to be catching hold. And I've soon figured out, okay, the Americans love fads. <laughs> now I definitely keep an open mind. Something comes across, I will check it out. I will definitely look at it. But as you can tell about 23 years later, I have a little sense of skepticism because of that. And it's a healthy skepticism. It's not closed-mindedness. That's real. There's an important difference. So gluten all of a sudden has hit the news. And I'm going, uh-oh. Because I don't want it to just be a fad because folks, it is more than a fad. I see in this room here some of my patients that have been with me for over 20 years. That I told over 20 years ago to go off of gluten to cure their autoimmune disease, whether it's MS, bipolar disorder, gut problems, weird skin issues. I can go on and on. Adult onset diabetes, 
obesity. And there were studies back then showing it, and the studies have just reached a crescendo, which I will present you with today, because I want to arm you with the fact that this is not a fad, this is real science, and it's been published in hundreds of, of different medically peer-reviewed articles. Medically peer-reviewed means that the best in the field have reviewed it, say, yep, this is good science, the study was, the, the study was well done. Uh, most of these studies took well over a year to complete with thousands of people. And as I'm going to casually go through some of the slides and, and show a slotty study, you'll see on the bottom here, Journal of Pediatrics or Journal of Gastroenterology, Lipidology, you know, all these different journals. Take a note on the wide variety of journals. It's from all the different specialties. So that means all of a sudden gluten has an effect on almost everything. It's not just behavioral disorders. It's not just MS. It's not just skin disorders. It's not just obesity. It's not just atherosclerosis. It's not just joint pains. It's not just osteoporosis, schizophrenia, anorexia. Yes, anorexia. All these things, no. It has a profound effect on everything and that is what we do in functional medicine. So have fun with this. Let's, go, let's dig in. This is what we're going to cover today. We're going to cover the web of health. We're going to cover gluten, why it's important, the research behind it, how to live gluten-free, how we treat problems associated with it. The May seminar says to be decided. I decided this morning, so I've got a slide on that. And we're going to announce our May cooking class. The web of health. This, folks, is functional medicine. You are at the center and there's many, many different systems that affect us and they all talk together. I'm not going to talk about every one of them. That, that would just take up the whole seminar. The detoxification pathways is affected by, what do you think, our environment? Oh yeah, very much so. I had a patient that came in just three weeks ago from Indiana, southern Indiana, with severe bipolar disorder. I looked at his detoxification pathways. He had a swollen liver. His kidneys were basically non-functional, only 64 years old, had not worked in over 20 years, was divorced, after more than 40 years of marriage, estranged from his kids, absolutely desperate, telling me that he would absolutely take his life. He had tried many times if I could not help him. Was on four different anti-anxiety and antidepressant drugs, which made it very murky to work up, as you can tell, because at this point you don't know whether it's a side effects from the drugs or what's actually going on. Tested him for mercury. It was one of the worst I've ever seen. This man committed suicide four days ago. He committed suicide because he was in such depths of despair. And there's two main things that drove him to do this. And he warned me about it. He says, I, I have these waves that I just don't see anything out of it. And if I ever do anything to myself, he told us, do not blame yourself because you have done incredibly well. He was so grateful for all the, the, the things that we were doing for him. But he'd only given it a two-week chance, which of course you can't do because what happened to him more than 60 years ago, his mom cleaned his wounds with mercury. Not uncommon back then. Even I'm guilty. I remember in the mid-60s playing with mercury beads. Just playing it. Just so fun. You just scatter across the floor. Woo, look at it go. Yeah. It was so casual back then. And so that's one of the reasons that he was set up for issues. His gut was totally ruined by the ravages of gluten. I'll show you a picture right away of what a gut like that looks like. The gut is the second brain. His detoxification systems couldn't keep up with it. And it was starting to affect him neurologically. Some people can go into MS, others it's Alzheimer's, and yes, others it's severe bipolar. This was the most brilliant patients I've ever had. His IQ, he told me, was 163. And yet, he could not withstand the abuse that gluten gave him. The web of health affects everything. Hormones. And I, had, I saw a hormone panel on him. 
it was unbelievable how strange it looked. I saw his, yes, we did a urine test on him and it was very strange. Musculoskeletal wise, he had muscle wasting and very weak tremors, right? And his cardiovascular respiratory system, asthma, absolutely, that's an inflammatory disorder, all caused by this wave of detoxification. So really it was going everywhere and then he was desperately going from specialist to specialist to specialist and that's not where the answers lie at this point. The web of health, <coughs> view yourself inside of it, how do those different systems affect you? The main structural protein complex of wheat and other grains is gluten. Gluten has become Franken gluten. <laughs> it is so vastly different than what God promised us as the staff of life in the Old Testament times. And we'll go over that. Why? Foods with gluten include all these different grains. Wheat, rye, barley, spelt, kamut, bulgur, couscous. And of course, that includes the bread, baked goods, pasta, cereals, noodles, all the good stuff. And then there's the sneaky little hidden sources. Dressings. Yogurt, processed foods such as gummy bears. <laughs> gummy bears, I just found out a few weeks ago, has gluten in it. Licorice, another one. It goes on and on. Processed foods, obviously then. Soy sauce, yes, you can get gluten-free soy sauce, just so you know. And beer. There's many different types of gluten reactions. I want to cover just three main ones. There's other ones I, that's not on the board, like for example, intolerance. Intolerance is where you just cannot digest it well, and there's a good reason why. And that's very, very common, by the way. And I'll, I'll touch on it just this little bit. Intolerance is why professional athletes that are at the very top of the field avoid gluten during competition time. For example, Tour de France, one of the most grueling races in the world. You've got to be able to recover after time trial or after a 150-mile 150 150 ride through the Pyrenees. Do this 23 days in a row with only two rest days. Incredible athletes pushed to the very limits. The very top athletes, gluten-free. Why? Research has shown that it enhances recovery from day to day incredibly. Why would it do that? They're in a less inflamed state because gluten is so tough to digest break down and thus you become less inflamed as a person even if you don't have a problem with gluten such as an allergic reaction, autoimmune reaction or immune, immune mediated gluten sensitivity. So does that mean that everybody can benefit from going gluten free? Yes, it does. And you, you will notice little things such as hmm, at the end of the day my sock lines are gone, that's fluid retention. Or you might drive to Detroit and step out of the car and says, you know, I used to be really achy after a long ride like that. Now I can just hop out, no problem. Or you don't get out of bed in the morning and your first few steps are like this. <laughs> right? And silly us, we blame that on getting old. Totally silly. Most symptoms of getting old, by the way, this is one of my pet peeves. Don't get me started. <laughs> it's lifestyle. It is totally lifestyle. I've seen so many healthy patients in their mid-80s, just fully vital, able to do almost anything they want to do. Shoot, I was treating a guy not that long ago, 87 years old, I was treating him for falling out of a tree. <laughs> I, could, I try not to engage in personal conversation because you never know where it's going to go, but this one I could not resist. He says, I, I said, well, what were you doing in a tree? He says it needed to be cut. <laughs> Isn't that absolutely wonderful? And then his son pipes up, age 60. He says, yeah, it wasn't just climbing a tree, it was jumping from tree to tree. <laughs> now I'd heard it all. And, and the six-year-old said, I was trying to help him, but I couldn't keep up. <laughs> Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And, isn't, and, and so this guy doesn't view himself as 87 years old. He was not being very wise. You'd think by 87 you'd have some wisdom. But don't you love that? Here, as soon, it seems like as soon as you've turned 40, you're on your way out. And it, folks, it's not true. I come from a country where my 95-year-old uncle 
was complaining to me that he, his, his doctor took his bicycle away <laughs> because he can't see well enough anymore. I remember really well as a kid, a guy on his bicycle would stop by, Mr. from Wingenden, he was all into his mid-90s, yellow wooden shoes, black suit, black hat, and that's how he would arrive every day to visit his kids that were living next door. So gluten is a major agent for aging. It ages and taxes us, just like too much red meat, too, like too many Skittles, all those things. These reactions, you can see gluten sensitivity is pretty common, 6%. Wheat allergy, less than 1%. Celiac disease, 1% of the US population. These numbers, I want you to know, are in dispute. I think they're going to be revised rapidly upward, but because this, everything I put on the slides is totally taken right out of the medical journals, I publish them as is, but my opinion is those numbers are going to be revised up sharply. There's some, there's some uh, uh, dissent out there already. With gluten sensitivity, you've got some stomach issues, headaches, balance problems, neurological things. Um, and the gluten-free diet uh, is what we do, although when something sneaks in here and there without us knowing it, it might not affect you that much. I debate that point, by the way. Wheat allergy. Now we're well on its way to uh, celiac disease. And this is a whole continuum, by the way. These are not separate disorders. You don't just go from zero to celiac disease. It's a continuum that goes from intolerance to sensitivity to allergy and finally end up as celiac disease. And most patients that I see, say, with an autoimmune disease, they're somewhere in that continuum. And if they could live long enough and abuse gluten enough, eventually they will almost certainly end up with celiac disease. Celiac disease is where there's outright damage to the gut wall uh, that is extremely difficult to repair. And I have some slides showing you how that works. So when you have a sensitivity, you can have IBS-like stomach problems. And uh, we had a medical doctor come in here uh, not that long ago with IBS and uh, had struggled with it for 20 years and just could not get rid of it and had tried everything possible with specialists, of course. I told him, well, why don't you just go gluten-free? He says, I tried that and made it worse. I said, aha, that means you're gluten sensitive. He, I, I got the look. And, um, uh, but that's true, you go through withdrawal and uh, the nervous system just goes crazy. He says, where's my drug? Because there's drugs in gluten lately. And uh, the withdrawal just tells me, bingo. So I says, well, why don't we add some digestive enzymes, work through that withdrawal, put in the good bacteria, some healing agents. And today, it's only been about four months um, he is virtually symptom-free. IBS, the supposedly incurable condition. Very simple. Headaches, behavioral changes, really big. You know how ADD is now so prevalent? 11% of our kids are now prescribed ADD or ADHD uh, uh, medications. It's an absolute disaster, folks. Uh, it, it is. Uh, many of them you can very easily change just by taking away the artificial foods and taking away gluten. It is remarkable how angry, defiant, behavioral disordered little Johnny can turn into a little angel that he really is by doing these very simple changes. And I love working with kids because they haven't had these decades of damage. It's, they, they turn around easier. So uh, bone and joint pain. You think your arthritis is old age? Think again. It is generally lifestyle inflammatory damage. Aging, yeah, somewhat, if you have had an old injury and this and that, these, some of these things accumulate, no question. But a lot of it is just unnecessary inflammation. Abdominal pain, diarrhea, weight loss, chronic fatigue, brain fog. I see so many patients, and so does Dr. Stacy, sees so many, many patients with brain fog. It is a gut following up your brain. The gut is the seven, second brain. 90% of your neurotransmitters are found in the gut. 90%. And if on top of that you have a damaged gut leaking through undigested food particles into your bloodstreams, which can cross the blood-brain barrier and then cause inflammation here, you think that would create a little brain fog, depression, behavioral disorders, schizophrenia, attention deficit disorders, Alzheimer's, all these things. The brain is simply responding to the environment it is in. It's not a brain disorder anymore. It is a systemic disorder. Numbness, depression. 
Atopic dermatitis, if it gets really bad, we diagnose many patients here with atopic dermatitis and I like to keep it a little bit general because there's so many sub-fractions of atopic dermatitis. But you can get into dermatitis herpetiformis and that is a definite celiac disease manifestation. Anaphylaxis is a pretty severe immune reaction. Where on earth did this come from? And here's where I want to get rid of the fad that I'm afraid is coming our way. Picture the mid-1960s. I'm a little kid romping through the wheat fields just outside my house near Rotterdam. I can still picture it fully, just really clear. And I didn't come to this realization until last year, by the way. So here I am playing in the wheat field where I'm not supposed to be. And I see all the, it, it was so fun because all the wheat would just close up above me. And it's like this, this, this as, as a kid, you could just see above you. And wheat back then was about that high. So it would just fully en envelop me. Wheat changed shortly thereafter. And I now realize that I, I, afterwards when I would play in the wheat fields, I'd get all scratched up. Why? Wheat had become short, stubby heavy on top. We had hybridized and genetically manipulated wheat. The guy that was responsible for this won a Nobel Prize for it. And that was it for gluten. We had changed uh, wheat into franken wheat, and they didn't know it. They did this because higher yield per acre could withstand droughts, fungus, other kind of attacks and could withstand wind better. Higher yield per acre, or hectare, as it is in the Netherlands. They changed this wheat to double the chromosomes, and compared to the original Einkorn wheat, that's the very original Egyptian wheat, we now have four times as many chromosomes, genetic material, within the wheat. It's totally changed gluten. We now have superhuman amounts of gluten in it. It has changed the protein in it to a franken protein, very inflammatory, foreign to the body, and it is virtually all wheat that's out there. Is organic wheat any better? No, it's the same stuff, just doesn't have pesticides on it. So the superstar is called amylopectinae, and really the the history, you can even take it back further if you want, and in our last gluten seminar a couple of years ago I described how in the 1800s the steam press was, was discovered and we could now press off the chaff off the wheat and we could preserve it better, so now we could preserve wheat in little packages, put it on the store shelf and it's good for weeks. And what that did is it allowed us to start eating more and more gluten because it was handier. We could store it, whereas before it was very, very temporary stuff. Does that make sense? So now we are consuming just incredible amounts of gluten because it's become, it's what we do for the last hundred years. And now that we've changed it, we've made something that's very inflammatory, toxic, engages the immune system, and has, I, I can go on and on, like one slice of whole bread, organic, has the equivalent of two tablespoons of sugar. That's what your body converts it to. So now all of a sudden we got a sugar issue at the same time. Think diabetes is a problem? 34% of the adult population is now pre-diabetic. It's a huge issue. Huge. So there's many different ways gluten makes you sick. We've chosen just five, because otherwise it just gets out of control. It's an autoimmune disease that triggers body-wide inflammation. Gluten causes gut changes and Virtually every autoimmune disease out there is a, really a gut disorder. My original doctoral thesis over 25 years ago was on rheumatoid arthritis. And I described even 25 years ago how it is solely a leaky gut syndrome issue. In other words, the gut is a problem. We've known this for so long now. Gluten is greatly contributing to the incredible rise in autoimmune diseases. Because this inflammation sweeps through the whole body, it affects your insulin receptors. Now the body says, hey, my insulin receptors don't work anymore. What am I going to do? You have insulin receptors on the cells, and they're there 
where a cell comes right in, where insulin comes in, attached to the insulin receptor, cell opens up and you can absorb your sugars to fuel cell health. Insulin resistance results when insulin receptors don't respond to insulin anymore. They've begotten, they've gotten contaminated, inflamed by the whole insulin thing. They've gotten it by the whole uh, inflammatory thing, sorry. So insulin resistance is really an inflammatory disorder of the cell wall, fueled by inflammation that's systemic, which really comes from gut inflammation. Phew, did you get that? That was really quite awkward. But really what I meant to say is, damage here equals systemic inflammation equals insulin problems. It's not just the sugar we're eating, folks. Yeah, that's part of it. It's not only the chemicals we're exposed to, but it's the gut damage also that's contributing to this diabetes epidemic. That's why gluten can make you fat. And that's why we have a runaway bestseller at the New York Times bestseller list called the Wheat Belly. There's really 55 plus conditions. We don't know how many conditions there are. Those are just autoimmune diseases that we're listing. So even when you do not have an insulin sensitivity, even if you don't have celiac disease, even if you just have that little bit of intolerance that all of us have developed, you get low level inflammatory reaction. Let's say cardiovascular disease runs in your family. Guess where it's gonna go? Cardiovascular disease. Let's say Alzheimer's runs in your family. Guess where it wants to go? Schizophrenia. How about plain old arthritis? Or varicose veins? Skin issues. How about acne? Very, very much tied to this inflammatory issue. Hormone imbalance, absolutely huge. Absolutely huge. And the level of infertility, PMS, perimenopausal symptoms is skyrocketing right now. Non-gluten, foreign, non-gluten native societies. So in other words, we're talking to northern societies like the, like the Eskimos or Inuit as they're now called. They don't even have a word for hot flashes because it doesn't exist. So non-celiac disease, gluten sensitivity, gives you adverse immune reactions in different parts of the immune system than in celiac disease. So what we're really saying in this article is that it can go anywhere A non-gluten glycoprotein called wheat germ, a glutenin, WGA, make a note of that one, you're going to see a lot of that in the future, increases whole body inflammation and may cause heart, attack, heart attacks. Okay, and I've got that cited in many different medical journals here. A simple little sentence, huge amount of research. This vastly outweighs anything that cholesterol could ever do. Cholesterol really isn't behind heart attacks for the most part. It is an inflammatory change, and we've known that for so long. The trouble that we have with cholesterol is that we've got this incredible industry that one out of four adults is taking a statin today here in the United States. Multi-billion dollar industry. And they're desperately trying to find little bits of proof that that is what the whole answer is. It's first thing, when you go, to, you go to your primary care doctor, it's first thing they do, well, you need to be on a statin. But doc, I don't have a high cholesterol. Uh, I don't have a heart disease history in my family. Doesn't matter, go on it, it'll prevent it. Seriously, those are the new guidelines. Never mind that it's a mitochondrial poison and will cause early death in you. Your chance of dying of other things are up, increased incredibly. And then another problem with gluten is eating too much gluten-free junk food. We have this problem so, so much in our office. Yeah, we tell them to go gluten-free. Oh, great. <laughs> Doc, you wouldn't believe what I find in the fridge. I admire, and in the freezer. And they come back and they're 10, 15 pounds heavier in a month. <laughs> Seriously, we see that so often. Folks, it's junk. Junk food is junk food, whether it's gluten-free or not. Yeah, chips are gluten-free, it's junk. You need to eat different. 
And we're going to cover in, we're going to go into that. But I want you to know that most of us have already issues with sugar because we are swimming in a sea of sugar. Over 150 pounds of sugar gets consumed per adult per year right here in America. And really, when you go back to only Abe Lincoln's time, it was only seven pounds of sugar per year. We've done incredible good job sugaring, our, sugaring ourselves to death. Don't let gluten-free foods add to that. So celiac disease, this is the end point of gluten sensitivity, right? We kind of figured that out by now. It's the probably the most serious. Everything that has research with celiac disease on it is really applicable to all facets of gluten allergy or sensitivity or even intolerance. It just happens to a lesser degree, that's all. But if you do it long enough, it will go there. Wheat amylase trypsin inhibitors drive intestinal inflammation. This is where the damage occurs. Celiac disease itself may injure the liver, but may also modify the clinical impact of chronic liver diseases when they coexist. So you have hepatitis and celiac disease. The two will compound each other incredibly. Why? Because you get what's called leaky gut syndrome, and that's where these little villi, they're like fingers, aren't they? That line the intestinal tract, they get damaged. They get damaged big time. And one, they don't absorb the foods anymore. So you get nutritional deficiencies. You get an inflammatory response, which rallies all kinds of evil hormones, which respond to that, which the liver has to clean up. And you start leaking undigested foods and byproducts of foods, like what I was describing about that red meat into your bloodstream and the liver has to clean that up. I have seen so many celiac disease patients with enlarged livers. Livers is totally overworked and it's probably lost more than 50% of its function. Now here's something very interesting. Patients on a gluten-free diet for less than a year had significantly higher levels of both pro-inflammatory proteins, cytokines, and Th2 cytokines, that's from a white blood cell, compared with patients on a gluten-free diet for less than, for greater than a year. This really says, well, hello, yeah, if you're lo the longer you're off of gluten-free, the less inflammation there's going to be. We didn't really know that until this uh, research study was done in human immunology, published in 2010, so pretty recently. Now, here's the other one, 50% of adult patients that have celiac disease treated with a gluten-free diet, very strict for 10 years, showed signs of poor vitamin status. In fact, I'll take it one step further. A recent study shows that a patient who's been 100% gluten-free for 10 years shows as much malnutrition, nutritional deficiencies as when they started. Now, isn't that disheartening? And the nutritional deficiencies are acute. We're not talking chronic, kind of on, on the edge. No, we're talking acute deficiencies. What that means is that the damage to the gut wall is so profound, the body has been unable to repair that unless you take special steps to do so. And I will go through that in a little bit. But if you just do gluten-free, you are stuck right where you were. Have you stopped progression? Probably. But you haven't gotten yourself well. People with schizophrenia have higher than expected antibodies related to celiac disease and gluten sensitivity. In other words, if you have schizophrenia, yes, your chances of having celiac disease or some sort of gluten sensitivity is through the roof. It really is, in my opinion, it's greater than 80%. But we have averages for celiac disease and these people are about threefold that average. So in other words, they're really, really reactive. And that's part of the story of schizophrenia. We treat schizophrenia. And it is remarkable how they respond. This is a supposedly incurable disease that responds very well to lifestyle changes. A review of all published studies from 64 to 2000 of patients with celiac disease that developed neurological illness showed the most common manifestations were ataxia, peripheral neuropathy, and myopathy. So neuropathy means nerve damage, right? So we're talking MS, all that. I was first exposed to a researcher who told me that just for fun, 
because that's how researchers view it. It's, it and they have to keep a sense of humor somehow. Just for fun, took 25 patients who were in a wheelchair and they could not figure out why they couldn't walk. Paralyzed, from here on down. I've seen two patients like that, by the way. And just bizarre. They had sensation, even a little bit of reflexes, but totally paralyzed. And no one could explain why. Medical enigma. They, just for fun, put them on a gluten-free diet. Three months later, 24 of the 25 could walk. He told me the one that didn't, he suspects cheated on his diet. <laughs> yeah, isn't that just absolutely amazing? And it was published as an anecdotal thing. It's not a real study. But still, it, I thought it was quite revealing. And this was, I think, about early 90s. So a long time ago already. We've, been, we've known about this for quite a while. 70% of children with untreated celiac disease show exactly the same abnormal brainwave patterns as those with ADD. Celiac disease has become quite common in kids that's not yet diagnosed because they have something called organ reserve. Lots of power to absorb all kinds of things. That's why I look in amazement at the amount of pops and skittles and all kinds of stuff they can consume. And I thought, I, I look at some of these kids and so if I were to do that, I'd be on the floor. Seriously. It just, it's just absolutely shocking, but that's because they have all that organ reserve that can absorb these blows. So a lot of them could have celiac disease without really having major symptoms. Maybe a little like the nine-year-old new patient that I had today. And his main concern is just tummy aches. Just tummy aches. Any bowel movement changes? No. Just tummy aches. Wouldn't look at me. I poked and prodded him and tried to make fun of him. No. <laughs> Gave me a high five though. So this young guy has celiac disease. It's only symptoms and occasional tum tummy ache. Well, how often do we hear that? But he had, I, I was checking his reflexes, and he, he couldn't do this, he couldn't do this, and he couldn't balance himself certain ways. So obviously it was starting to affect his brain already. Cardiac dysfunction in children is becoming more and more prevalent. When it comes to gluten sensitivity, so now we're going back in that continuum a little bit so not in the in celiac disease anymore, shows gluten-related disorders exist from higher gluten uh, content during the last 10,000 years and lack of gastrointestinal adaptation. This is published in Lancet Neurology 2010. I just mentioned that because Lancet is one of our most famous magazines as far as uh, this medical information goes. Gluten sensitivity is a systemic autoimmune disease with diverse manifestations. So our top medical journals is now saying, well, we now know. And they're finally coming to that realization. I so wish that all the gastroenterologists and neurologists and the psychiatrists and the obstetric gynecologists and the fertility specialists and the orthopedic surgeons and all these people would just get in a room and look at this stuff together. Say, hello, you think there's maybe a correlation amongst all these things? I don't think I'd want to be in the same room, though. <laughs> this is what the damage looks like. This is not quite celiac disease. Remember those fingers where things get absorbed? In celiac disease, they are worn totally down and they're flat. There's no more absorption. That's why 10 years later, you're still seeing the malabsorption, the nutritional deficiencies. When it just begins, you see ulcerations occurring on the villi, right at the very tips. You think there's a little inflammation there? Remember, this is, the gut is 70% of your immune system. And when you're bothering your gut, you are bothering the immune system. And it's not just about the common colds or this or that, it's about everything. It's about getting up like this out of bed in the morning, right? And then finally, oh, yeah, boy, I'm, I think I'm getting older. Mm -mm. This is what's happening. So most patients with neurological manifestations of gluten sensitivity have no gastrointestinal symptoms. So in other words, the body is adapted to it. It says, okay, I'm going to make this work. I am always in awe of how the human body can adapt to a condition. Because theoretically, that should really hurt, you would think. No, patient doesn't feel it unless I start pushing in it. 
Vitamin D deficiency may compromise the mucosal barrier, leading to increased susceptibility to mucosal damage and increased risk of irritable bowel disease. American Journal of Physiology, Gastroenteritis and Gastrointestinal Liver Physiology, um, published in 2008. Really what they're saying is, you know, vitamin D affects the tight junctions that keep the pieces of the small intestine together. And when we, that doesn't work, when you don't have enough vitamin D, 94% of Kent County two years ago was deficient in vitamin D in the winter, 94%. Things open up and you start getting inflammation because undigested food particles can go into the bloodstream called leaky gut syndrome. We've been laughed at as a naturopathic uh, profession for the last hundred or so years about that term, leaky gut syndrome. It now is common terminology as of about three years ago because the American Gastroenterology Association now says, yeah, it's a real thing. We discovered something new. <laughs> Go back to 1908, it was first published. Research on gluten sensitivity. Tests in gluten sensitivity have different specific markers than celiac disease. And here they are. And yes, we can do blood work for that. Early introduction of gliadin containing cereals increased the risk of islet cell autoimmunity in children in less than three months. There was just an article that was published uh, saying that, you know, folks, we got a problem. We're introducing foods too early. Yes, we are. Solid foods are being inter introduced to infants four months or less. You shouldn't even begin to think about introducing a solid food until the first tooth erupts because this is part of the gastrointestinal system. Remember, it's a system, it all works together. So if this is starting to mature, then finally this is maturing too. And that's your sign that we can finally start introducing foods. We're introducing foods way, way too early. And then if we're doing wheat on top of that, like a lot of these cereals, you are creating this inflammatory response that will affect the islet cell autoimmunity. This is setting up the kid for diabetes. Check out diabetes and type 1 diabetes, the autoimmune type, it's phenomenal how common it is and most of them are related to early gluten introduction. Landmark study here. Gluten sensitivity is a state of heightened immunological responsiveness to ingested gluten proteins in genetically predisposed individuals. The brain seems particularly vulnerable. All we're saying here is neurological tissue is the most vulnerable to the attacks of gluten inflammation. Yes, everything is, but it seems like the nervous system especially. That's why if a patient comes in with MS, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, you know, that whole group of thing, the first thing we do is pull away gluten. And we have seen total remission of these disorders. Yes, you heard that right, total remission. Just by doing repair work and taking away the toxin. Treatment with a gluten-free diet has been associated with rapid gains and even normalization of bone mineral density due to improvement of calcium and vitamin D status. So now we're linking it to osteoporosis as well. Osteoporosis, I think, will be classified as an autoimmune disorder soon because it is nothing more than chronic inflammation of the bone. It will be an autoimmune disease. It's got all characteristics of it, so I don't know why it can't be, and I'm surprised it's not yet. And it is definitely linked to inflammation of the gut. We now know how that works. There's actually serotonin uh, pathways that signal to the bones whether to grow or to lose, and it starts in the gut. And these serotonin, ner that's a neurotransmitter, you heard that one right, these serotonin signalers are affected by the quality or health of the gut wall. So if you're doing anything to really affect the quality of the gut wall, whether it's too many antibiotics, medications, gluten sensitivity, or let's say you have a sensitivity to, I don't know, corn, nuts, whatever. That will definitely trigger osteoporosis. Gluten especially is a culprit, we've proven it. So, I want you to know that this was a very, very tiny slice of the pie. I have on my desk at home, and my wife is not pleased about this. An entire desk, it's a big desk, and the research on it is literally this high. I've just taken a few that I thought, well, that's, that's kind of a cool one, and some of the latest one of 2012. It is absolutely overwhelming wave of research that proves this point. So is this a fad? 
No, I think the public is waking up to the fact that there's something to this, that when they go off of gluten, they feel better. The thing is, they have to do it 100%. Because gluten has this funny little thing that's like an on-off switch for the entire immune system. Let's say you have a dairy sensitivity. That is a totally different animal because it only lights up part of the immune system for most people. There's, there's exceptions to this one, obviously. And if they go out and they have an oopsie with it, uh, oh well, haha, <laughs> um, your gut's going to be a little bit disturbed. You're going to have maybe a few symptoms. And there's, there's exceptions to this rule. I want you to know that. Some people go into acute asthma and uh, others have eczema. And, you know, that, that's a stronger reaction. But really, most, most of these symptoms go away after two or three days. Gluten is different. Had a fellow come in that's doing lifestyle therapy right now. He's involved in something we call boot camp. Because he came in at 320 pounds, I believe. Three... I don't know the exact number, but it was a lot. And I was really in awe because he works out three hours a day. Has a very restrictive diet. Runs 10 Ks. Just really phenomenal shape and very obese. And could not budge that thing no matter what he did. Absolutely couldn't budge it. So, on his BIA, the bioimpedance analysis, which we use as part of our workup, saw just a ton of water retention. Okay, this guy is very inflamed. Go further into it, and he almost casually says, well, yeah, I've got a little bit of ulcerative colitis also. I said, ulcerative colitis? Well, we're talking something very major here, and very much tied to gluten sensitivity, allergies, it's part of the celiac disease, it's part of that whole spectrum. So it's okay, yank gluten out, let's get rid of your, your, your sugar issues that you have, Let's get you less inflamed. Let's do some repair work to your thyroid and adrenals because they've been totally stressed. He now clocks in significantly lighter, except today. I don't know if you noticed, but he gained 10 pounds. 10 pounds in just a, a few days. So what happened? Well, I went to Chicago and I thought I'd treat myself. I said, what? Well, you know, you know, they, they kind of sit there real sheepishly. And I had the pizza and, <laughs> and a hot dog. Yes, and a hot dog. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking at him and says, well, look at this. Your muscle mass just declined by a percent and a half. Your body fat went up by 3%. Your weight is way up. You're, f you're retaining fluid like mad. How do you feel? He goes, uh, well, I won't repeat what he said. <laughs> And it's much, much later. This is not just this temporary little blip. He just took his whole immune system and put it on fire. It's not just a simple little thing here that he can just knock out. No, this is the equivalent if you take a tennis court and you put all kinds of mouse traps on it. You, 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 you uh, spring them all, whatever, the, arm them all. You set them all, thank you. <laughs> And you put a little ping pong table, or ping pong ball rather, on each one. And then just for fun, bing, you let one go. It lands, bing, two go. They land, bing, four go. Eight, 16, 32, 74. No, I'm not gonna keep going. <laughs> but you get the story. That is exactly what happens when you have a gluten sensitivity. It just goes bing, and then and pretty soon the whole thing is obliterated. That's your immune system on fire. And that's why it's not a two-day blip, but at least a 10-day blip. At least. So that's why people who are saying, ah, I can have myself a little treat on the weekends, you might as well just have gluten full time as far as I'm concerned. Does that make sense? So going gluten free is not for the faint of heart in the beginning. Once you are there, and you are feeling better, and you're in a groove, and you can walk into a store and this is what I eat, boom, 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 boom. Yes, that is not as much work, but getting there is, and knowing the tricks of the trade. That's why we've employed health coaches. That's why we have handouts. That's why we try to teach you about it. With bread, use almond flour or coconut flour. 
This pasta, we use zucchini, spag uh, spaghetti squash, and rice noodles. Rice noodles are delicious, by the way. I prefer them. And baked goods. You didn't hear it here, baked goods. Pizza, <laughs> cauliflower or quinoa crust, and um, you can also buy them. Um, crackers, nuts, rice cakes, gluten-free crackers. And these are some wonderful grains, such as amaranth, buckwheat, oats, corn, planta, quinoa, rice, teff. Be careful with oats. I'm, I'm treating this, this, um, this guy, he's now 18. And he has an inability to grow at this point. And a lot of neurological symptoms. Behavioral stuff, bipolar kind of stuff, pretty severe, anxiety. And we keep on checking his blood for all the markers for sensitivity to gluten. And they're still so high, even though he's gluten free. Oats, supposedly gluten free, not always. For those that are really sensitive, it can keep your symptoms going. So you gotta be careful even with this one. It depends where you're at in the spectrum. If you're into celiac disease, as this kid obviously is, you can't have anything that's contaminated by even just a tiny particle. By even just a tiny particle. So, you have any thoughts about that, our health coaches? You're doing great. Yeah? Okay. I guess I keep going. I would just, I would just add naturally gluten-free foods are going to be more satisfying, uh, cheaper, and I, I think overall more nutrient-dense to begin with, so. Do you hear that? Naturally gluten-free food. So we're not talking the gluten-free in packages, which are expensive and will break the bank, too. Good for treats like birthdays and stuff, but not for regular everyday living. You just have to eat different. A little more Mediterranean without the bread. So how do we, how, how do you attack this? Go to our webpage. Go to resources. It's a new button. And we're putting piles of stuff on there. It's adding almost every week. I'm pretty excited about it. Hit the blog, like last week's blog was on allergies. What am I doing to prep my patients for the oncoming allergies? And yes, there's gonna be plenty of blogs on this whole thing. So hit that. And we have just become hip. <laughs> Can you believe that? <laughs> Facebook. Oh. That was my punishment for that one. Um, it's, uh, what we have is uh, uh, our, our uh, DBC is on there, Nature's Remedies is on there with all kinds of hints and acoustic compression. Acoustic compression I'll talk about in a sec, how that can actually help with gluten sensitivity. Yes, I'm on Twitter. YouTube. You'll see this seminar posted there sometime next week. Just go to the webpage, hit YouTube, there it is, and you'll have the slides full screen so you can look where the research came from and have a good review of today's uh, topic. And Pinterest, got to have those pictures in there. <laughs> so how do we tack these patients that come in with obvious signs of gluten sensitivity and the damage they, they have encountered? Exercise. Why exercise? As long as their adrenals are not burnt out, as long as a patient's body is not under a huge amount of stress, exercise raises your anti-inflammatory components. In fact, last year it was published that it even affects how our genes are expressed and our very genes itself. The very first research that we have ever that shows we can change our genes. It absolutely shocked the researchers. Exercise. Gene expression is a whole other thing. And gene expression is, we all have genes that are good and bad, right? It's just, it's just the way it is. But even our bad genes can be expressed very, very good, as long as you play nice music to it. You've got to tell it fairy tales, not horror stuff. Franken foods are horror, okay? Very inflammatory, makes the evil genes express themselves in an evil way. And if there's even a blip of, say, MS or Alzheimer's or diabetes in the background somewhere, guess what rears its ugly head? But it doesn't have to. It's not at all inevitable. And I really want to emphasize that because the genetic, the whole genome, just five years ago, 
to get that measured for you cost over twenty thousand dollars today a thousand they think by the year 2015 100 your entire gene tree displayed the science is moving on us incredibly fast and I don't want you to think that oh I got this bad gene that bad gene that bad gene you're gonna stress about it but there it is no it should empower you to live an anti-inflammatory lifestyle that's clean so you can really fully live what God intended us to and thus nutrition jumps in you have to repair because once damage has been done you are in what I like to call something called metabolic load metabolic debt so you're fighting this chronic inflammation it's going to cost currency your adrenals your insulin receptors your skin your varicose veins the things we have vanity about your brain and eventually yes you accumulate a metabolic debt that has to be repaid which means that you have to overcompensate before normalcy goes because a lot of people think well I can just turn the switch go back to good living and everything will be fine not and it's very frustrating for the patient you have to overcompensate stay there for a while wait for things to correct and then you can moderate those steps some I so remember well being so incredibly frustrated because here I was in my late 20s had gotten a few doctorates so I'd been in school nonstop for many years and worked full-time at nights supporting two kids at that time and then when I finally graduated my adrenals truly crashed you know the feeling right that's it's you got okay boom there it went mono hepatitis my immune system was just shot I looked at pictures of me today at that point it, 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 look at this and it, I was so ill I thought well okay I'm gonna eat really well and I'm gonna take care of myself I'm gonna exercise got sick just exercising moderately temperature outside high, more than 75 degrees would make me ill one sip of wine I could feel it weirdest thing sometimes so tired that I would just sit in a chair stop breathing for a while just to give breathing a break honestly just not functioning it took two years of hard hard work before I could start doing again what I'm doing today see I had this metabolic debt that I had to repay all those years of this total abuse of three hours of sleep a night and then studying like mad and working and you know all, all the things and I thought I'm doing pretty good was for a while but there was a debt that had to be paid and that's what happens with gluten sensitivity or allergy or celiac disease if you've been at it long enough you've got damage that needs to be repaired you've got to get your adrenals back you've got to get your thyroid back you have got to reduce the inflammation you've got to give your body super nutrients good bacteria digestive enzymes and agents for the intestinal tract to heal itself and we do that through many different ways and this web of healing only applies to DBC by the way there's many different webs of healing acupuncture yoga uh, uh, medications uh, yes they have a place in, in this whole thing called functional medicine um, so so really these are the ones that we employ to get our patients well chiropractic health neurologically you can do an incredible amount patient comes in with heartburn because their gut is so unhappy yes you can adjust and actually help the heartburn almost on the spot because it relaxes the nerve going to the stomach and the stomach responds to that positive input it's really cool and that's why to this day I love adjusting because you get some of that immediate satisfaction nervous system important part of health acoustic compression this is something that's really gee whiz very much on the on the cutting edge of, of science uh, in Europe has been around for a while but this here is done in the United States it's called lithotripsy lithotripsy is where we smash kidney stones with sound waves you might have heard of that and what the Germans noted about 18 years ago was wherever they did lithotripsy right there arthritis would disappear bone loss would reverse itself trigger points within the muscles would normalize inflammation would leave and it was permanent so they started doing some studies on that and these acoustic 
compression, so these, these st strong shock waves of sound, stimulate stem cells to gather to that area. And stem cells are kind of the fix-it-all cells. They're the magic things. That's really the buzzword lately, isn't it? And stem cells are really cool because if you have varicosities in the veins, it can repair that. If you have some cartilage loss, it can repair that. You have trouble with ligaments that are fraying a little bit, it can lay down new layers. It can do so many things. It's very regenerative. It was first done with plantar fasciitis, where the bottom of the foot is inflamed. And that panned out really well. That was about 18 years ago. And then now it's being used for many things from cancer to, yes, gut damage. And I've seen my patients with Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, celiac disease, and all those types of things. When we start applying acoustic compression to the gut, it is amazing how it can reform itself. And we can hurry along in just months what otherwise would have taken years with just pure nutritional intervention. So acoustic compression has become an important part of DBC, as is lifestyle coaching. Lifestyle coaching is absolutely critical. Folks, if you don't do what we tell you to do or know how to do it, it's all for naught because you cannot rely on just acoustic compression or you cannot rely on just, just an adjustment or, 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 or just some pill to get you well. No, it's got to happen in a whole umbrella of things. And lifestyle coaching is a critical aspect that I'm so proud of my, my health coaches. Would you guys stand up? Because they, they're, they're, they're out here sa saving, saving so many health issues um, that I, I couldn't do without them and neither could Dr. Stacy. Uh, and we're like, oh no, you're too complicated to go see them. No, um, it's, it's, uh, but yeah, sometimes it does happen, doesn't it? Um, so so the, the amount of material that they've produced for us uh, and to educate us uh, is, uh, is pretty phenomenal and uh, to this day, uh, You'll see more and more new stuff being published. Uh, that uh, We're expanding that one, it seems like, uh, every month. So lifestyle coaching is critical. Detoxification is how we start. Almost every patient has gut damage because it's overburdened the detoxification pathways. The liver is not happy. The kidneys are not happy. The skin is not happy. Your detoxification pathways are clogged. And just getting rid of the toxin will not restore detoxification pathways. You've got to get them back up and running because they have stalled. This is critical whether you're a cyclist and you're trying to recover from the intense effort to let's say you're an accountant and you have brain fog and your, and your brain is just being clouded by toxicity to PMS where your hormones are not being detoxified or perimenopausal menopausal symptoms. I can go on and on. Re-establishing detoxification pathways is critical and it must be done in the right way because very often the way most people detoxify it's a little bit like taking a blower in your garage and trying to blow out the dirt without opening the garage door you get this cloud storm and it just settles wherever it wants to settle on your car and wherever else no you want the exhaust fans on you want the garage doors open so it can go out and then hopefully strengthen the detoxification pathway so it keeps going it's got to keep going even after done detoxification we use nutraceuticals that are third-party assay. This is really, really important. And on our resources page, real quick here, it's not there yet, you're going to see all the pages that we put of torture, that we put our companies through, of the questions we ask, the, uh, uh, the things we demand as far as uh, uh, other labs assessing, clinical trials that we want. Is it made in a facility that's uh, been approved by European high-quality uh, controls, uh, German Commission E, and I can go on and on and on. It's, um, it's literally five pages long, five prints that we require our companies to adhere to. Otherwise, forget it. We're not going we're, we're to work with you. Our patients work very hard for this. We work very hard for it, so it better work. And community. Why did I put that in there? Have you ever heard of the term fridge rights? It's a really good sense of your community. How many people... How many people's homes can you go into and just freely open up the fridge and help yourself to something? That's a pretty good measure of your community, isn't it? You have to have friends, family, and people that you can relate to and share with. You need to be part of the web of community. That's why being local is so important. From visiting the local farmer's market and chatting, ah, how was your harvest today? You know, doing, I love doing that, by the way just shooting the breeze as they say, but it's part of being in a community. To having friends, it is 
huge, what a difference it can make as far as healing. It's that undefinable thing that is so hard to put under research, but we know it's true. Community is an essential part of healing. And doctor support. Somebody's got to be the cheerleader. So gluten has become a villain. It is no longer the staff of life that it was promised. It has become this inflammatory force that has profoundly affected us, driving some of my patients to suicide. And I want to close with just one tiny little tidbit here. Not that long ago, I had a patient who just had mild depression. Kids, very busy, 40s, think a lot of us can relate. Sleep deprived, but really inflamed. And she had a really a strong family history of issues, autoimmune diseases. So I said, you know, you better put you on a detoxification diet, one month, which includes reducing, or not reducing, removing gluten. And she did really well, perky, skin started glowing, bright eyed. She was really excited. She says, well, not, now we really have to start reintroducing foods. She did not want to, she felt so good. She says, well, I really want to find out if you're reactive, then we know how strict you have to be. Otherwise, you never know. And by the way, the elimination diet, I feel, is the gold standard for figuring out gluten. Because I don't think we have any, all the blood tests, stool analysis, urinalysis, and all that to truly figure out all the different aspects, ranges of gluten sensitivity, intolerance, al allergy, celiac disease. I think we're still in the process of developing that. So elimination diet is the number one way to figure this thing out. Six weeks minimum. So we started introducing foods that we had taken away. And finally, it came time for the gluten. We get this desperate call. Doc, I am so suicidal. I'm on a road right now, right to your office. It's everything I can do to not drive this car into a bridge. She had introduced gluten just an hour before that. It had thrown her into such a tailspin, it was absolutely scary. Got in here, we did some talking, things settled down. I explained to her logically what, what, what was going on. And we, we got through it, but it was just a lesson to me, again, how incredibly powerful these inflammatory hormones and messenger molecules can affect us. Some of us profoundly, and some of us on this little simmering brush fire. We're all somewhere on that scale. Why not eliminate some of the toxic elements we're exposed to? Go for it, you'd be surprised what you can do with all this. Topic next month is hormones explained. I came across a lot of research with gluten and how it affects hormones. It's pretty profound. On average, testosterone has decreased 40% in males. Fertility has decreased by 70% in males. We have an unexplained amount of uh, perimenopausal, menopausal, PMS-like symptoms that goes way beyond what just stress will explain. And so that got me thinking, okay, maybe we should really do a seminar on this. Not just the, the relationship of gluten, but how everything just works together and how it has a systemic effect. That's, that's next month. So we're going to be talking about libido, stress, PMS, and that whole thing. And then, here's the star of our show, eat the rainbow. Mm -hmm. I love saying this myself because people ask me, how, how, do, you, how do you eat? I says, well, I eat the rainbow. Gets a few funny looks. But as long as you have a bunch of colors on your plate, you're doing good. I know I'm a guy, I, I kind of oversimplify, and I, I do, my lifestyle coaches are kind enough to let me know that once in a while. But really, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but I honestly feel and, and I get chided for this, don't I? That, that eating doesn't have to be difficult. You don't have to have these gorgeous, exotic recipes, right? And uh, they're fun on special occasions here and there. I mean, absolutely. But, but as a general rule, you don't have to be that way. So we're going to try to teach you how to eat. 
Did you know that the biggest weightlifters, the ones that are Olympic quality, the ones that lift seven, eight hundred pounds above their head, how do they do that? You think they eat a lot of meat? Almost all of them are vegan. They eat vegetables. Why? It's a superior source of protein, way beyond what meat can provide. And there's no way they could be a meathead and lift those kind of weights. <laughs> this is where it's at, folks. Research after research after research has proven it. So that's how we do it. Go for it. Is, is Ezekiel bread, the sprouted bread, gluten-free? No, it's only lower in gluten. And it absolutely is not gluten-free. You will cause inflammation by eating that. Um, it's, a, it's a rather unfortunate thing, um, but it, it is not. Uh, when you try to sprout your gluten, uh, sometimes there's some that don't sprout, and bingo, there it is. Um, now, I, an interesting thing though, wheat grass is entirely gluten-free. It doesn't have any of it in there. What's that? And so is buckwheat. Any more questions? Yes? Apart from wheat and corn, then should we be concerned about any other grain being being involved? Yeah. Yeah. Are you talking about GMO? Yeah. Are you talking about GMO? Yeah. Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Well, this is, by the way, this is the first year that our government has allowed uh, uh, sweet corn uh, to be hybridized and genetically modified. So, uh, brace yourselves. Whole foods, by the way, I have to applaud them. They are now uh, labeling all foods that are genetically modified. As of five years. As of what? Oh, I didn't know that. As of 2015. Oops. 2015. Oh, people back. 2025. Okay, Trader Joe's is already. Trader Joe's is there. So, um, uh, and, and that's the one, really the big thing I miss from Europe is, is you can just safely go into the grocery stores. It's not legal there. Folks, they know what they are doing regarding that front. Many things they don't. But as far as genetically modified foods, not allowed because the first, this starts back in England. England was one of the first ones to do it because when they introduced genetically modified soy, by the, by the way, 92% of our soy is genetically modified, um, uh, they found an incredible increase in emergency rooms for allergy rea uh, reactions, anaphylaxis to hives to all kinds of respiratory conditions, and they were able to quickly nail it down to sensitivity to, to the new soy that had been introduced and was sold to them as higher yield and pesticide resistance and you know everything was promised about it. So they got rid of it almost immediately, and most Western European countries followed suit, and to this day now. Genetically modified foods are not allowed in. This really is a North American phenomenon, yeah. uh, and it is really a shame. And I think uh, there has to be groundswell uh, movement uh, to uh, to try and eliminate it. I see it gathering steam. Yes. Questions? Let's keep it moving. Yes. <laughs> if there's a hundred people here tonight, how many of us would not? need to go gluten-free and how many of us would not benefit from going gluten-free? Well, the question is, if, if, if with the amount of people that we have here tonight, how how many people would benefit from going gluten-free? Everyone. Everyone. Just the benefits would vary from person to person. In the one person, it might mean that they only get 10% less inflamed. Which, by the way, if you're doing Tour de France, that is big time. To those of us that it can be a life-saving measure and literally add 30 years of functional life easily to their life. It depends on their environment, the amount of stress they're under, their diet, their genetics, and how it's being expressed. Um, so, so that's why I urge everyone at least at some point should go gluten-free 100% and be honest with yourself and just kind of watch yourself and do little things like, like I mentioned something silly in the beginning of the seminar, like sock lines, right? That's what I mentioned. That's what I noticed when I went totally gluten free, 100%. Said, and it took a few years, by the way, before I noticed it. Hey, my sock lines are gone at night. Now, it's a silly little thing, I know, but it does mean there's a little less inflammation there, doesn't it? And honestly, I was already feeling energetic, feeling good, good moods, all those things. It's just tiny little things like being able to hop out of the car without having to stretch and, and, and you know, just things like that. And really, you're banking. For the future too. You're not digging into your organ reserve as much and wearing it out as quickly. Does that make sense? It's definitely worthy to experiment. <laughs> Is there anybody left? Oh. Yeah. Any questions? Yes.
privately held conviction. Um, I've not seen it in the research, um, but the instance of this is murky territory. So the question is this: Is is there any wheat that is not reactant that is healthy for you? And in theory, yes, but in practice, I don't think so, unfortunately. There's such a wheat that's called einkorn, and that we've been able to find old ancient wheat in the pyramids that still, after all those thousands of years, you put it in the soil, voila, it sprouts. Unbelievable, I think. Uh, and we've been able to duplicate it. It's called ein, einkorn um, wheat. And uh, it's only got the 14 chromosomes instead of the duplicates that we have. So in theory, that should be non-inflammatory. That is the staff of life that was written about in the Bible. However, once you have become reactive to it, it's now a close cousin to the wheat and you can still react to it. It's called that cross-reactivity and it's kind of unfortunate. It's a little bit like when I have a patient who's severely allergic to bee stings, they will also swell up quite a bit with mosquito bites. It's that cross-reactivity, just not as severe. So where you want to take that is up to you because <laughs> it it's murky, vague territory. I am absolutely convinced that einkorn is less reactive. However, you don't know until you've fully been off, fully everything for a while, and then reintroduce that and watch your moods, watch your energy, watch inflammation. Lucas, you had a comment on that. So here, here's someone that has experience with, with einkorn um, and reintroducing it. This is a, a quite a reactive patient. Um, and, uh, uh, and introducing einkorn, uh, he found one third the reactivity compared to, uh, compared to uh, normal. Now, it, this is gonna vary from person to person and this is why it's so murky. So this is a question of autoimmune disease which are closely linked to gluten sensitivity. Uh, and uh, this was a statement that if you uh, early on in life move to an, a, a state other than Michigan, which puts us in a bad light, doesn't it? To say Arizona or somewhere south, that the incidence of uh, autoimmune disease is considerably less. And that is definitely true. I don't know about threefold less, that might be exaggerating the point. But it is less and the answer is very, very simple, vitamin D. Vitamin D affects the closed gap junctions within the intestinal tract and when you're deficient in vitamin D, you are much more prone to intestinal disorders as a whole, to leaky gut syndrome, and therefore you're going to become even more reactive. If you're living in Arizona, does that mean all of a sudden you're not reactive to gluten? <laughs> totally false. You just might be a little less reactive than you would have been in Michigan because your vitamin D quantity is, is at a better status. But I will tell you one thing, that Florida seems to have a problem because so many people there use um, uh, the, um, the sunblocks that they're not producing vitamin D and their vitamin D deficiency is almost the same as Michigan. Um, so, so this is why every one of my patients supplements with vitamin D in fall and winter and early spring. Um, I give 5,000 units a day of uh, vitamin D that I know actually works. Um, a lot of research has been done into this, hoping to prevent a lot of this autoimmune incidence. Okay, so steel cut oats, can you rinse them and try and have them be gluten free? Nope, doesn't work. Um, sorry, you have to go with gluten free. You are reducing the gluten, but you're not eliminating. Just a comment on how sensitive you can be when you have celiac disease. This was an individual, they have separate toasters, celiac disease. Husband accidentally used the toaster and was sick for three days just by that little bit of exposure. It is phenomenal, folks, what we see here. Remember the, the woman who wanted to drive into a bridge? It's just amazing. Okay, I think we're gonna wrap it up. Um, I believe there's some important game tonight. Someone told me, I don't know what this is about. Um, honestly, I had no clue, can you imagine? I live in this little different world. So, have fun watching that. And um, thanks for coming here, appreciate it. <laughs>